I now return to the electromagnetic spectrum. And classically, it's all well and good to draw these nice pictures and say that you have different regions of the spectrum that do different things. X-rays, for example, for imaging versus visible light for viewing versus microwaves. But what classical physics mostly can't answer is why you have different frequencies that do different things. And now we have this very powerful and very simple rule from quantum mechanics, delta E matter, the change in energy between two states of matter, is equal to HF, F being the frequency of the photon. Therefore, by setting HF equal to delta E matter, we can figure out which frequencies of light are related to which changes and which transitions and which physical processes in matter. The way this works is reversible in both directions. If I have a photon heading towards a physical object, absorption of that photon can trigger the energy transition that I calculated by delta E. So for example, if I have a photon which corresponds to the energy and molecular rotation, and the photon is incident upon a molecule, it's absorbed, makes the molecule spin faster. We do have a classical cartoon picture of what this is. The example that I'm using which is that electromagnetic waves or light exert forces on charged particles. Molecules have charged particles, electrons and protons. The electromagnetic wave, the photon, physically acts on the charges in the molecule, exerting a force, physically making it start to rotate. I say reversible too. It can go in the other direction. I can have a molecule emit a photon as it changes state. It's analogous to the kickback when shooting a gun or a projectile. The emission of a photon pushes back on the molecule, slowing down the rate of rotation as it's emitted. Of course, this doesn't tell us why or when a molecule will emit a photon, just that it's possible. Absorbing a photon makes it spin faster, emission of a photon makes it slow down, all very real, very physical, very intuitive. So now let's go through the electromagnetic spectrum, starting from the low frequencies, and we can answer with this powerful equation why different frequencies do different things. Starting with microwaves, frequencies of the order of gigahertz, 10 to the 9 billions of hertz, up to terahertz, 10 to the 12, I already said that corresponds to the energy and molecular rotation, or rather differences in molecular rotation states. And at the top end there in the terahertz range, that goes up to about 0.05 electron volts in energy. And with E equals HF, we've established that a microwave can be absorbed by a molecule speeding up the rotation and can be emitted as the rotation slows down. So why is it that delta E of molecular rotation does indeed have that value of around 0.05 electron volts or less corresponding to microwave photons? It so happens that for a broad range of small molecules, CO2, air, O2, and N2, with not too large atomic weights based on their masses and the size of the molecule, they're like little rotating objects or little spinning tops. And of course, I mean mind-bogglingly little, small spinning tops. Based on their masses and the size of the molecule, we can calculate the moment of inertia, which will tell us what the kinetic energy of rotation in some state is. And it so happens that for this broad range of molecules, the differences in that kinetic energy correspond to less than 0.05 electron volts corresponding to microwave photons. Now we move up to infrared. That's 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14 hertz, corresponding to around less than one electron volt, say 0.5 electron volts. By E matter equals HF, what transitions in the states or physical processes in matter correspond to this less than one electron volt energy? Molecular vibration. Nuclei of molecules can be imagined as little balls on a spring, and they vibrate back and forth. This means that absorption of a photon makes a molecule vibrate more or with more energy or with greater amplitude. And emission of a photon makes a molecule vibrate less, or with less energy, or with smaller amplitude. And just as with the rotation example, it's all very physical. There are charges in the molecule. Electromagnetic fields exert a force on those charges. A photon incident on a molecule pushes on those charges and induces a higher state of vibration. So why is it that delta E matter, the difference in energy of these molecular vibration states, does give us this approximately less than one electron volt energy, which by E equals HF corresponds to infrared frequencies? Once again, it so happens that for a broad range of substances that we encounter everywhere, CO2, O2, N2 as before, but also many solids, the ball and spring model gives us, based on the masses of the atoms, 
and the strength of the bonds, energy differences of vibration of about less than one electron volt. And this ball and spring model is less ridiculous than it may sound because it's a fundamental mathematical law that any system at equilibrium, when displaced slightly from that equilibrium, can be modeled with the same dynamical equations as an actual spring. So based on the masses of atoms and the strengths of bonds, the difference of energy of vibration does correspond to infrared. Now there's additional fundamental equation and infrared is the right place to introduce it. All systems that we encounter in the real world are not at absolute zero temperature. And because they have some temperature above absolute zero, they have some random, we call it thermal energy, they're bouncing around. Classically, often temperature is a measure of kinetic energy, so higher T, faster motion for a certain molecular weight. So when talking about E equals HF, the relation between energy transitions in matter and photon emission or absorption, we have to remember that any system encountered, say we go into a lab at room temperature, any system will have some random energy which will define the base level of energy for changes by emission or absorption of a photon. And this additional equation tells us what the thermal energy is. It says KV, Boltzmann's constant, times temperature is approximately approximately the average thermal energy per molecule based on the temperature. If we set this average random thermal energy equal to HF, we have a relation which tells us what photon frequencies our system can emit just because it's not at absolute zero. Now room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. Multiplying that by Boltzmann's constant, converting to electron volts, we get about less than one electron volt energy from our 300 Kelvin room temperature value. This, of course, corresponds to the energy of molecular vibration, meaning that at room temperature, molecules are already in a state of vibration. Then E equals HF says that those molecules can emit infrared photons. So you have this system at room temperature. Molecules are vibrating randomly and also emitting infrared photons, dropping to lower states of vibration. But they're also absorbing infrared photons from the surrounding molecules, and that leads to an equilibrium. The important point is, you look at a system of molecules at room temperature, there's going to be some infrared photons flying around. If we measure the frequency of those photons, rearranging the equation tells us T is equal to HF over KB. We have a measure of temperature based on frequency of infrared photons it's emitting. So temperature sensors, ones that work radiatively by not touching an object, they work by absorbing infrared photons emitted by an object and that, by this equation, gives us the temperature. When you see a thermal map of something, you know, with different colors that represent different temperatures, that's often created by measuring infrared emission from different points on an object and plotting. Another hugely important application of the infrared is spectroscopy. Because molecules absorb light of the same frequency as their vibration, that is, the electromagnetic field is oscillating with a certain frequency. It imparts energy to a molecule, which it's in resonance with. And we also said that the frequency of vibration of the molecule is related to the atomic masses and the strength of the bond. Because of this, the frequency of absorption of a photon is related to the type of bond that you have. It gives you information, again, about the masses and the strength of the bond. So this is the whole field of spectroscopy, relating the absorbed light to the structure of the molecule. Certain bonds with certain atoms vibrate at particular frequencies. IR spectroscopy is one of the most powerful tools to analyze what a molecule is. It's so simple to draw these pictures of molecules and to make these mental abstractions. But you go into a chemistry lab and everything looks like white powder. How do you know what chemical you have? Spectroscopy is crucial. So you have microwave, they make molecules rotate. Then infrared, they make molecules vibrate. And the next part of the electromagnetic spectrum is the visible. The visible goes from about 10 to the 14 hertz to 10 to the 15, from about 400 nanometers in wavelength down at the red to less than 800 nanometers in the blue-violet. That's of the order of several electron volts, less than 10 in energy, 
and different frequencies of light represent different colors. The only thing special about visible light is that we have built-in visible frequency detectors, our eyes. Vision, seeing things, is our eyes and brain creating a plot of visible light frequencies coming from different points on an object, not unlike the thermal plots I just discussed before. Now also, when we talk about the colors of objects, we're not talking about objects emitting their own light, say in the manner of a glow stick. We're talking about a source of visible light, say the sun or a light bulb, shooting light in an object. White light from the sun or a bulb comprises all the frequencies in the visible spectrum, or approximately all of them. Different molecules absorb or reflect different frequencies of visible light differently. So the phenomenon of color is that certain frequencies from the white light source are reflected back from an object to our eyes, while others are absorbed. And of course, the color we see is due to those frequencies reflected back to our eyes. So this tangent is just to remind you that we have built-in visible light frequency detectors in our eyes. But the more important point is again, by E equals HF, what are the physical processes and states that have energy differences that correspond to visible light photons? The states are electron states. Electrons are the lightweight particles that move around in the electric field of the much more massive nuclei. And previously with rotation and vibration, we were talking about motion of the heavy nuclei themselves. Now we're talking about what you could call a change in the internal structure of the molecule, how the electrons are distributed. And I say distributed because according to the laws of quantum mechanics, we can only calculate the probability of where an electron will be found. But this probability distribution is associated with some properties, such as the energy, and that's what we mean by the state of the electron. In the Bohr model that started quantum mechanics, electrons were viewed as going around in circular orbits, just like planets revolving around the sun. Absorption of a photon increased the energy, leading to a higher orbit or a larger orbit radius. Emission of a photon led to a lower orbit or a smaller orbit radius. And as the story goes, this picture is far too simplistic. We can't view electrons as particles undergoing deterministic orbits. We can only calculate the probability of where they will be found. So these days, it's a whole field of science to calculate what these electron states are, what these probability distributions are for different types of matter. But so happens for a lot of things that we encounter in everyday life, these electron states, the transitions between them, correspond to about several EV in energy, that is the energy of visible photons. By the way, using the thermal energy equation, what temperature T is equal to HF over KB corresponds to visible frequencies? Temperatures of the order of several thousands. And that's why the sun, which emits visible light, has at its outer surface a temperature of the range of several thousand Kelvin. After visible, we go up to the UV, ultraviolet. Ultraviolet photons also act on electron states, but because they're higher in energy than visible frequencies, we have enough energy now not just to move an electron around, but to entirely rip it off a molecule. And that's called ionizing radiation, because ionization means a molecule or an atom losing an electron. There's a critical difference now between the lower frequencies, microwave, infrared, visible, and UV and beyond, because starting now at UV photons, we have enough energy to not just jiggle a molecule around, but to rip it apart, essentially to destroy it, which ultimately will trigger chemical reactions, chemical change, rearranging of atoms, forming new molecules. So that's of course why UV rays are dangerous. The reason that they're dangerous for us, for example, UV from the sun, the sun obviously gives visible light too, but also ultraviolet, it can harm us because UV photons ionize molecules in our skin and body. It can ionize or destroy DNA or cause it to grow differently, which leads to cancer. After UV, we go up to x-rays. Now we have photons that are so energetic, they can rip off not just the outermost, most loosely bound electrons, which are called the valence electrons, but electrons that are closer to the nuclei called inner shell electrons. X-rays can rip these off again and destroy the molecule. 
So they're the same picture of UV as ionizing radiation. X-rays are, of course, harmful to body, bodily tissues and can cause cancer, just as with UV, but even more energetic. Now, you know that X-rays are associated with imaging. And at this point, we have to remember that delta E equals HF doesn't just tell us that a certain frequency of photon is corresponding to certain physical processes. It gives us a precise matching condition. And if we don't match the condition, then there's no absorption. So despite how energetic x-rays are, if the molecule doesn't have that energy transition, it doesn't absorb the x-ray. The x-ray goes right through it. So basically, x-rays go right through the tissues in your skin, which mostly consist of low atomic weight atoms, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, because they simply don't have the states corresponding to x-ray photons. But your bones, which have calcium, which is a higher atomic weight element than what's in your tissue, these heavier calcium atoms have those transitions corresponding to x-ray energies. So when x-rays hit the body, they go through the tissue, but they're absorbed in the bones. And that's why x-rays are used to image. But wait, doesn't it destroy molecules? Of course. This is why x-ray exposure, even for something beneficial like imaging, must be kept to a minimum. And this is exactly what we know about x-rays, that they're used for imaging, but they're still dangerous, now explained by quantum mechanics.